We are going to start the session. And I'm really happy to welcome uh, Andreas Olterman. Andreas is currently professor at the National Research Center for the Working on Environment in Copenhagen. His main field of research is on occupational physical activity and health. He started investigating in prospective court studies and workplace interventions how it can be that while leisure time physical activity is so beneficial for health, the physical activity performed as a part of the job does not seem to give the same health benefits. He termed this phenomena on the contrasting effects of physical activity during work and leisure on various health outcomes like cardiovascular disease, sickness, absence, and mortality as the physical activity paradox. It's an extremely interesting topic. We have so few publications in this field, and it's a great scientific question to solve, and I hope you will give us some results of your last uh, works. Thank you, Andreas. Hello everyone, how are you? It's a bit hard to see you in this uh, spotlight. Um, so I'm really up for this test, right? It's always the hard work to have this keynote right after the lunch. So I will do my best to be as provocative as possible to keep you alert. Um, and I promise Adrian Bauman back there that I will now come and tell you the truth about how it is with respect to physical activity at work and leisure and health. And uh, let's see about that. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organization, the HEPA conference, steering committee to inviting me. And actually, I think it, when I first got the, the invite, I thought about why are they inviting me for the, to give a talk like this? I'm one of the researchers who have published most on one thing that is that physical activity might not be beneficial. So I found this quite strange that a uh, health enhancing physical activity conference is inviting me. So then I thought about, well, should I dare to do this? Would I just put, be put up in some kind of a guillotine up here or um, what, how it would be? But uh, let's see how it goes. Um, I have always found it very fascinating to see that the approach to physical activity, movement, activities of our body can be so different. I'm coming from, perhaps in this room I would call it, the dark side of physical activity. So the conferences, the research, the practice, which is about preventing harm from physical activity. Sounds crazy, right? But it is a completely big right, uh, field in occupational health, which is about making sure that they don't get injured or musculoskeletal disorders or health issues from being physically active at work. And I just think it's so fascinating to come here, right? And it's all about all the benefits of physical activity, which is also really a good thing. But to start out with, I would like to ask you one thing. And that is, if we have a conference which is about a term called health enhancing physical activity, can someone tell me that to be able to show, say the definition of health enhancing physical activity, what is then not health enhancing physical activity? Is it some kind of sport? Is it some kind of movement? Is it some kind of posture or whatever, which is not health enhancing. I think this is, I think this is quite interesting uh, from a point of view that why didn't you just call the conference for physical activity? Because physical activity is healthy, right? Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, I know, uh, often I start out with this, uh, uh, this picture I, I took off up in the mountain in the Lofoten, where I come from, in northern Norway. I was hiking up here with my mother, and I guess that many of you agree of, with me that walking up mountains like this is something of the most health-enhancing thing you can do. 
your social, you get your heart rate up, you get a really nice view, and it's a really good thing, right? I personally really believe in that. But then up to here, I had this massive discussion, almost arguing with my mother about these guys who were working, putting all these stones in the staircase all the way from the, from the bottom there and all the way up to the top, putting it with manual labor. And then it was the local newspaper had in interviewed these guys and they had said, this is the best job in the world. We get really to use our bodies so much better than all those people sitting in the offices. Um, so we get fit and strong. I think this is a really good example of the need for being very specific about physical activity. Is it some physical activity which is health enhancing and other is not? Is it so that it's the privileged high socioeconomic group, they are using these staircases to walk up the mountain, enjoy the view and scenario and the health benefits, while those workers doing this job, making this available for us highly educated people to walk here, that they believe that is health promoting. Do we know that these type of activities are health promoting? And that's been my passion for many, many years. Uh, to be able to, at least to go out and say to many of those workers, in Denmark, for instance, based on questionnaires, is one third of all, all uh, adults say, are saying they have a um, quite manually active work. One third. And still we are not really be able to say, well, the activity you're doing as part of your work, is that health enhancing or not? Because it makes a big difference if you want to motivate them or make systems approaches to encourage them to be more active during in sports and leisure. But many of those, they believe that, no, I've been doing, putting stones the whole day, so I don't need to be active. Okay, I think you get the point. Um, WHO is very clear, and I, lo I love clear messages, right? All physical activity is good. Every move counts, right? Everything is good. The more the better. No matter which domain, which type, which posture, which load, right? Right? Come on. That's, that's what we are saying, right? But what matters is to get people less inactive, more yeah, less, less sedentary, more active, right? Uh, which is fine, I'm, uh, respect to, I think it's marvelous, particularly respect to how well it's communicated. Um, but I have some kind of a personal story, uh, which I've, uh, in this journey I've had, it's been several people also here, which is here in the crowd, been together with me on this. And it was when I, I came originally from health science, in Norway, and then I moved, moved to the Occupational Health Institute in, in Copenhagen. And one of the things which we started to work on was these type of workers, cleaners, often non-ethnic uh, Western po uh, populations, so they are not drinking alcohol, they are not smoking, but they are at terrible health. The fitness levels are so low, but we measured, Matt is also here, we measured that they could be walking if they were cleaning at hospitals, up to 20,000 steps per day. Unfit, unhealthy, not smoking, not drinking alcohol. Might be that the diet is not the best, but anyhow, the 20,000 steps should help out, right? And this was just, for me, coming from the health field into this occupational field, it was just a paradox. How can this be? And is it really the physical activity or is it something else? So then we termed it the the health paradox, which is, in general, if physical activity is the most valuable thing you can do for your health and well-being, how can it then be that those being most active in society are those, those having so poor fitness and health? I, at least, think it's a paradox. 
uh, I've been doing a lot of studies, and Adrian, he asked me to tell the, the personal, uh, the personal uh, journey in this. And in the beginning, it was in 2007, 8, right? Then I started to work on this, uh, with the cl these cleaners and these type of things, trying to figure out what kind of research do we have. And then I went to Copenhagen, and in Copenhagen and in Denmark, we have really, really good cohorts, really good prospective cohort studies, right? So I approached each and every one of the PIs of these cohorts and asked them, how can it be that you have only published on your data on leisure time physical activity and mortality or CVD, but you haven't published on the occupational physical activity, which I know you also have information about? Then they said, well, it looks so strange. No one gonna believe this. And it's showing something different than leisure time physical activity, so we have just decided not to publish it. Uh, so for that reason, we started to collaborate with a lot of these really good researchers, good people, uh, to do, um, yeah, to investigate this association between occupational sensitivity and mortality and cardiovascular disease. And uh, this is one of the studies from Karen Alisö, and uh, Mette Odal was also on this, she's also here, uh, finding that not that the more physical activity among nurses, this is only a nurse, female nursing cohort, right? The more physical activity, the higher risk for ischemic heart disease uh, uh, incidence. So it just shows the opposite what, what we could see in uh, the big guidelines and uh, the other recommendations. After this, we have been publishing a lot of studies uh, but it's recently becoming more and more meta-analysis of the studies, and most of the meta-analysis shows that we cannot see the same beneficial health effects of, of the activities you're doing during work. So the manual, those having manual work, we cannot see the same beneficial effects as the strong, consistent beneficial effects which is coming from sports and leisure time physical activity. Even like here, we f find for all cause mortality, actually we find a small increase in risk. Uh, Bart is also here. Uh, he published another meta-analysis on cardiovascular disease outcomes, finding more or less the same. We don't see any clear beneficial effects of occupational physical activity as it is for leisure time physical activity. And actually for some outcomes, we see the opposite. Actually that it might increase the risk. That's what we find. Uh, and then it's always, like you know, it's always limitations with all these studies. Self-report, problems with uh, having statistical power, problems with uh, really having good confounding control. But one day uh, I discovered one cohort, which I thought, this one, that's it. Here we can really test it. And I was so fortunate to, to uh, make this, this paper with some colleagues where we tested among more than 100,000 people the association between physical activity at work, which is the red dots, and physical activity at uh, leisure time, which is the green dots, for, for uh, cardiovascular events and for all-cause mortality. Where we ad adjust for all these factors, as you can see here. And I think everyone, you don't need to know much about statistics, but to see that it seems like they, they are going in different directions, right? It doesn't seem to be giving the same kind of effects. And we tried also to really test it. We tried to adjust for everything we could imagine to be confounders or bias factors. Kobe uh, habitation, marital status, household income, education, occupation, and still in the lowest model here, you can see the same trends. It doesn't seem to de be given the same effects. It is also, it should also be seen, it's also studies finding the opposite, that some kind of adjustments can see, seem to abolish some of these harmful effects of occupational physical activity. And I think also that's of course really important, but also really important in, for those of you who are ethnologists about what is really the confounders and bias factors which you should uh, adjust for. But I, I will not go into that here, but I think that's also really theoretical uh, important discussion. If we go to Sweden, they have some amazing data. This is one of the data sets which, which they have collected on half a million workers from 2000 to 2020, I think it was, uh, on sub-maximal cycling tests. 
And they could find then, when they just split, they split it up in several groups, what I'm showing you here is, is about white collar workers, high skilled, blue collar workers, high skilled, white collar, low skilled, and blue collar, low skilled. And you can see who's having the lowest fitness. And it's quite fascinating to see if their prognosis, what they forecast, is actually holding the truth, then you ha will have particularly those blue collar, low skilled, often having manual jobs, right? They will be having a fitness level being very, very, if you have a, if a fitness level of 32, then just walking like this, just very simple daily tasks and work. And one of the reasons for why I think this is very problematic is that in one of the studies, we looked at it, the importance of cardiorespiratory fitness. So what we have here is that we have uh, submaximal cycling text. I'm now here only shown for those having low cardiorespiratory fitness. So those having less than 32 about that. In, uh, in fitness level, and then we could see that the higher levels of physical activity at work, the higher risk for ischemic heart disease mortality, as you can see, among those not being fit, right? For those being moderate fit, we could see some tendencies for the same increase risk, but for those being fit, we could not see an increased risk. So it seems to be really, really important to have the fitness and the capacity necessary to be able to perform your job without getting too exhausted, fatigued, overloaded, right? And uh, then I think it's particularly uh, problematic that several, like the, the Swedish study shows that the blue collar workers seem to just to have m lower and lower fitness levels. So what, um, how can this be? If you look into physical activity, you're experts, right? Physical activity can be of so many kinds and sorts and intensities and what's not. But very overall, we can see that physical activity at work is mainly of rather low to moderate intensity. It's often of long duration. It's not only about 20 minutes or 30 minutes, about hours. Every, so five days a week. It's often static, awkward and repetitive movements, and it's often with insufficient breaks and rest. And we know from, and it's also common more and more studies showing that, for instance, if you don't have a high intensity, then you don't get the fitness increase. Uh, it's also shown that it's related to increased 24-hour uh, heart rate and blood pressure and information markers. It came a really good study last week in British Journal of Sports Medicine on that, and also on musculoskeletal disorders and reduced functional ability. So it starts to come more and more studies showing that these type of characteristics might be, might be causes to these type of issues. But I think what is most important, and that's, I'm also really happy that that's a, one of the main topics of this conference, is that it's not only about the characteristics of physical activity. It's about the context. It's, it's about the domain. It's about the causes to how the activities are performed. And if you look then at work and leisure, it's just extremely different. You know, for work, it's for most people, you are active as earning for a living, right? You don't do it for be healthy or something like that. You do it to earn money. Uh, for leisure, it's most, mostly for pleasure, well-being, and health, right? And I think another really important part of it is the degree of control and influence. That at work is really a demand. There's so many people in our society, they cannot decide themselves for how active they should be at work, how many steps they should walk, when they can take a break, how much they could lift, and these type of things. So at leisure, for most of us, right, it is it's a choice. You can choose if you want to do it this morning or not. If you're fatigued, we can take a week off, right? And then, then it's also for respect to recovery. And I think those of you who are into exercise science, they know, you know how really important recovery it is, right? If you're really putting a burden on your body, it's just so important to have the recovery necessary to get some health and fitness effects. And often in work, it's not sufficient. 
But in the end, right, this type of work and leisure, that's so, some kind of a domains which us humans just have composed or figured out, right? The body doesn't know, the body truly really doesn't know if you're doing something for getting paid or not, right? The body know, doesn't know if it's for work or if for, for leisure, right? And for that reason, of course, in the end, it's just so important that we need to know what is the health effects of 24 hours. Not only looking at, at the effects of the work or the leisure, because it's what you're doing throughout the day which is important. And I really like the Canadian gui guideline really pushing this uh, really strongly. And uh, I think it makes good sense, several of these, these uh, recommendations they're having about in general move more and reduce sedentary time and sleep well. But I have one question I think is so important. It is because humans have very, very different constraints and contexts can we give the same 24-hour guidelines, the same, identical for all? Can we give these type, of, these type of guidelines to, let's say, uh, manufacturing workers? We have thousands and thousands of, of manufacturing workers, for instance, standing, static standing, five to six hours during work, right? Should we tell them that you should just move more, reduce your sedentary time, or just sleep well? I'm just worried that so much of the evidence we have is based on privileged populations. Because those less privileged are often not included. They're not participating in court studies, for instance. We don't see many slaughterhouse workers who have, who have court studies, public health court studies, including slaughterhouse workers. Construction workers, you know, it's so hard to get them to participate in these type of, of studies. So I'm just afraid that in many cases, the evidence we have is for those, is based on the privileged. And um, we tried to write up an editorial on that, uh, Melody and David and, uh, and others, uh, which is also here. And we call it the sweet spot hypothesis. It's a little bit inspired by I've always been really inspired by Morris, you know, Morris and the studies on the bus uh, drivers and conductors, right? About taking this occupational uh, group perspectives. Um, I don't know how much familiar you are with these type of uh, ternary diagrams, but I'll, I'll try to, to go th through with you. Uh, so this figure shows accelerometer data on uh, office workers and here you can see in a ternary uh, diagram how much the population is sleeping. So you can see on the x-axis here is from 20 or less to 80% sleep. Up there is sedentary time and down there is active, right? And everyone knows if you are, you cannot change one thing without changing the other, right? So what we have done here is first of all to see, well, where are most of the white collar workers, uh, what's their competition? And we, what we can find here is the average composition is the black dot. Um, and there you can see it's about 30% active. It's about 20, uh, what is it, 30, 35% sleep, or in principle is in bed. And it's a bit more than almost 50% sedentary, right? But what we can see here is that when we associate this with self-rated health, then we can see the guideline um, sit less, move more, is perfect on towards those reporting to have best self-rated health, which is those in the green, uh, greenest area, right? You can see it. So that the more, the, the guideline is showing perfectly how the, the office workers should behave to have a best self-rated health. It's cross-sectional, so it's just showing the concept, not, not any causality here, right? For the cleaners, we see the opposite. We see the completely opposite. Here we see that they have, of course they have a different composition. They're actually sleeping or in bed a lot, almost 40% of the time. They are not that sedentary, so it's, it's just 30% of the time and they are active a, a little bit more than 30%, right? And here you can see those being most, having the highest self-rated health is those being highly sedentary. 
less active. And you can see here that the guidelines sit less, move more. It does not go towards this, the, those having best health and better health. So I think we need in the future to also have data on these type of populations which are not the privileged. Because I think it would be so terrible if us sitting here and being privileged, I think all of us, are saying, well, it's us having a problem. Poor us sitting down here for several hours of conference. No, it is not. And if someone is in doubt of that, I think we should invite someone out to slaughterhouse workers, for instance, fish industry and other type of things, which is just a completely different issues with respect to physical activity. Um, but what about solutions? How, how, how are we with, with time? Is it okay? Five minutes? Okay, uh, because it's, it's a little boring and uh, disappoint, no, uh, depressing just to talk about issues, right? Um, so one of the first, uh, I think, solutions which many of us have tried is to try to say, well, if we know what is health promoting physical activity, let's try to make those workers, manual, low educated workers, to be active during leisure time. And uh, how much knowledge do we actually have about that? Do we know which time, if you are having a job where you, for instance, is in an uh, elderly care facility, you are walking 15,000 steps and you're completely fatigued at work, what would you recommend that person? Is it to go out for a run, some HIIT exercises? Actually, we, we, we have some studies, but we don't know much, right? In our, in our uh, latest observational studies, which I mentioned previously, what we see here is, is actually quite devastating. Here you have, so it's, this shows the risk for, for cardiovascular events, prospective, fully adjusted. Here you have the level of, of uh, leisure time physical activity on the downside here. Up here you have the levels of physical activity at work, right? The group having the lowest risk, it's the group being very high leisure time physical activity, right? and low occupational physical activity. Who's that? That's us. You can expect to live until we are 90 or 100 years old, right? Who's having the highest risk? Those having high leisure time physical activity and high physical activity at work. I get a bit nervous about these figures, right? Just imagine, uh, these are uh, observational studies. It's self-report, it can be confounding, it can be several things, right? But just imagine if this is correct. From this data, it seems like for those having very high occupational physical activity, we should try to encourage them to be moderately physically active at least, time, right? Yeah, but I think it's really, really hard. We have tried several times and a lot of studies have tried to make those being manual, short educated, workers to be active during leisure time, and it's so difficult. It's so difficult to find a system approach to make them actually active. Uh, what about another, another solution then? It is, and I know several of you also have tried it, is to try to offer or implement health enhancing physical activity during paid working hours, which I think in general is a good idea, right? And here, this is data from Meta's PhD uh, study where we did uh, this intervention among cleaners. We will try to we use this intervention mapping to try to get their inputs and, and feedback on what type of exercises they would like to do during paid working hours. They ended up doing uh, 60 minutes per week. They actually did only did 40 minutes on average, two sessions per week, aerobic physical exercise, during paid working hours, right? Compared to a randomized control group just get, getting advice. What we found there was just amazing. Just imagine you have a group of, of workers who are active as part of the job 37 hours per week, right? 37 hours per week. And then you on top of that, you just put 40 minutes of high intensity physical act activity. And what we find there is that their fitness levels, it increases 40 minutes extra on top of 37 hours. So fitness increases, 
their uh, inflammation markers decreases, their uh, heart rate at work, because they're getting more fit, so it's less strenuous to do their work at work, so they can do their work with less, less strenuous, less musculoskeletal disorders, a lot of really, really good health benefits. 40 minutes on top of 37 minutes. And then I think just it's just so fascinating to believe that can we say that all physical activity being healthy, when you have those massive dose and you just put on some top of something we know is, is uh, healthy and it just shows these amazing effects. In Copenhagen, uh, they really took this in. So the Copenhagen municipality, they said, we want to have fit, healthy elder care workers, which are able to maintain the job for a long time. It's not about well-being or health or looking good or feeling good. It's about you should offer exercises mandatory, as a mandatory task um, to keep fit so you're able to work. And this they have actually implemented. It's, uh, I think it's, it's had some issues during COVID, but for several years it was actually mandatory to do exercises during the workplace in a social setting. And so when you got, so they were in the employees got the, the employee contract, they actually had to sign that one of the work tasks is actually mandatory work task is to do health enhancing, fitness improving exercises for six to 7,000 workers. But it's also a lot of issues, which I think you know, respect to, respect to workplace health promotion, particularly among those, those less privileged it's often relying on individual motivation and resources. It often becomes a kind of add-on, right? We have to step away from the core tasks, the productive tasks, and do something and for the exercises, which ta takes time away from the productive work. And, in, and, right, and that means that often it's mostly offered to, and it's also uh, implement, implemented in the best way among the privileged, right? So it's re I don't think it's, a, it's really a good solution for the less privileged. Not by its itself. It's my per personal opinion. But then I have, have thought about this for a long time. Couldn't we try to build better system to make this occupational physical activity health promoting? So we are sure that by doing your work, doing your work tasks, you actually get healthy by doing that. Just imagine if we could make sure that all the slaughterhouse workers, they were actually getting more fit just by doing their work. But what would that take? We have called it the uh, Goldlocks Works Principle because I think in many, many cases, many, particularly in occupations, we see that they are really lacking this fit. You know the, the Goldilocks story, right? The, the girl going out in the woods, had a house of the three bears. Uh, it, she tasted the porridge. It, it was either too hot or too cold, and then she had the, the just right one, right? And then this was the same with the chairs. It was too tall or too low, right? And the same with the beds. She found the, the just right one yet. I think for work, which is the big difference from leisure and from fitness and sports, is that work is designed to be productive, effective, not to promote health. So often with respect to, it's not just right for health promoting physical activity. So what we tried is to do a, a little bit of the same as you have done, several of you. You have been out in childcare institutions because in Denmark, it's been a massive interest in making children more healthy, more active, which is a really good thing, right? But if you look into the employees, those taking care of the, of the children, they have really some issues with fitness, obesity, blood pressure. So what we thought about, well, how can we make the work, the pedagogical work of the childcare um, teachers so they get fit out of it? So then we look, looked into the pedagogical uh, what's called, uh, um, programs and the, it says that it's known that, of course, the really important task is to make the children more active. That's one of the ma main tasks of, of, uh, of the childcare um, teachers. But it's also known that if the teacher is active together with the children, right, then it's easier to get more of the children also to join and be active. So 
So what we made then was together with uh, childcare institutions, we made different uh, games which were uh, targeted and aimed to make the children active, but the childcare teacher should be in the middle and be the most active and get in the heart rate up. Then we did a, a feasibility study on that, showing that, well, we if you just measure the heart rate on, on the childcare uh, workers, then they never get their heart rate up. They are saying they are doing a lot of games and plays with the children. When we measure it, nothing. Less than 1% is, is of a high, high intensity, right? But during these games, when we try to make these games, then we find that during the, the games, the, they were actually, the kids loved it, kids got active, and the childcare uh, teachers, they got more than half of the time a high intensity. So now we're testing it out in our CT to see if we really can get the, the childcare um, um, workers more healthy and fit by just by doing their work. Another thing which I, th uh, I really hope that more of you will dig into in the, into the future is, for instance, manufacturing workers. Here is a measurement of accelerometers which we have done on some hundreds of manufacturing workers. And this is on average. On average, they are standing, static standing, more than five hours. Have you tried that? I guess some of you have been to concerts and other things where you try to stand for five hours. The swelling, the issues with respect to that, right? And what we can see when we're coming out there, in a system approach, what is really determining the physical activity of these workers? It's not their motivation. It's not their knowledge. It's which type of work tasks they are having. Those, those workers who are driving the, the forklift, or what it's called, right? That person is sitting all the time. Another person is lifting things and being active all the time. The third person is perhaps might be standing all the time. So we, what we try then is together with the company, together with the, with the union, together with the production managers, think about how can we design work so it is not only is productive, but so the workers get healthy by doing the work. So they get a just right, sweet spot, health enhancing physical activity. It should be possible because they are having a lot of activities. So what we found in general, this was just, so it's just a small, small feasibility study that we found that actually they could, on average, reduce some of the standing time, increase some of the sitting because they are in need of some more rest, increase some of the active uh, time, and then we also, f they reported then less pain and fatigue, which I think it was quite positive. So now we are testing this in the RCT study, which is just finalized. Elder care, I think, uh, elder care, the last, last slide. Elder care, I think this is a big issue in uh, Europe. We are, have le really lacking staff in elder care. We're getting more and more elderly, right? These are uh, uh, axiometer measurements of steps of elder care workers. You have the number of workers on the y, on the I, y, uh, on y axis, and you have the number of steps during the day, during the working hours on the x axis. You can see it's a massive difference by doing their work. Why haven't no one taught, talked about how can we make a system where we try to organize this work so the workers actually get healthy out of it? Because they are taking a lot of steps. Can we try to make those steps for all of them health promoting, right? And you can see some of them, they are walking way too little. Others are probably way, walking way too much instead of coming and offer them some kind of sports or exercises. So I think the solution would be, and it would be so cool, if more of you also would be interested in joining that, uh, that, that task, is what about trying to make some system approaches at workplaces for the non-privileged? So we try to design work so the workers get healthier and fitter just by doing their work tasks. So back to the last one, is all physical activity health enhancing? Uh, I promise to give an uh, answer to that. Uh, I think in principle, we cannot say that a single physical activity is harmful. It depends on so many factors. So for definition, I, I don't think we can say that any kind of movement, any kind of load, any kind of is 
her definition of harmful. It depends on the circumstances, the control, the person, right? But what I think might not be health enhancing is the composition. If you have a composition which is way too strenuous, way too little relaxation, recovery time, too little sleep, I don't think that's, that's healthy. But we don't hardly know anything about it. So I would really encourage that we get more research and have another perspective on how to make health enhancing 24 hours compositions during the day. So um, I just hope that some, particularly some of the, the young ones here being the future of HEPA would, would be interested in joining this type of task, which is just taking more the uh, 24 hour perspective and particularly focusing on the less privileged. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you so much for this provocating presentation. <laughs> we don't have much time for a question, but maybe one or two before going to the next uh, session. Please, if one or two questions. Adrian? Hi. Uh, should uh, fitter people oh, sorry. do more work or more intense work? When you are fitter, do you should more work? If you are more fit, should you do more work than people who are not so fit? Uh, no, that, that's, that's the classic work physiology question, right? Make sure that the workers who are having the hardest work to be fit, right? And the fitter the worker is, the more work you in principle can do. Um, but I think that's the old days, right? Uh, today, I think we, we cannot be able, we cannot go that way to, to tailor the type of amount of productivity of the work based on the fitness. But what we know is the more, the, the more health enhancing, fitness improving, physical activity you can make, so the, the workforce is fit, the more, the, the more they are capable of, of right? Without getting injured or sick. <coughs> Adrian Bowman, Sydney, Australia. One quick comment, one quick opinion and three quick comments. My opinion, and I've never said this publicly to any sp speech I've heard, that was outstanding and thought provoking, Andreas, because it makes us think about and challenge the ways in which we think about physical activity. So that's my my first comment. My, my three comments are, one, in the global WHO world, we need to reconsider physical activity in low middle income countries, where, where leisure time activity might be a very small fraction of what they do, and we need to rethink that. Comment two, we need to rethink domain specific measurement when we measure physical activity, and not lump it all together to, to one total construct because it might negate bits within, within the same measurement. And three, we need to search more for solutions for inflammatory biomarkers and other methods, which I'm sure you're doing, to look at how this is happening in terms of increased cardiovascular risk. And again, my first comment, an amazing talk. Thank you. It's, it's time to move to uh, the other session. I'm sure we could discuss about that. This is an amazing uh, discussion. And thank you very much, Andreas. And few gifts from Université Côte d'Azur to bring back to Denmark. Thank you very much. Thank you. I invite you to, to join your, the next session. Thank you very much. And you can talk to Andreas at the coffee break. I'm sure you will be available. Thank you.